Happy New Year, everybody! Welcome to yet again another installment of the Voice Tracks podcast series. I'm Samantha Paris. You know, it was nearly a year ago when Sam Pond came to me with this rough idea of a comedy writing class for Voice Tracks. He wanted to run it by me first to make sure that we had something there, and I told him I thought his idea was wonderful. That any time a student could gain perspective from the other side of the glass, I felt it was invaluable. Now, first off, learning to write copy, it's not easy. But then to have other performers perform what you wrote and hear whether they bring to life your vision can be rewarding, but it can also be brutally heart-wrenching. Anyway, I don't want to give away what's in store for you in this fantastic Sampon interview. Just have a listen. You're going to learn a ton, and you're going to take great pride in our student-written, student-performed spots. Hi, everybody. It's Vicki, and I'm here with the legendary, award-winning writer, producer, director, actor, teacher, Sam Pond. Welcome, Sam. Wow. Hello. That's a lot to live up to, eh? I'm not even going to try. (laughs) You don't have to. So, uh, Sam, I was lucky enough to be a student in your latest voice tracks class called the Great Comedy Radio Acting and Writing Class Competition and Podcast, or as we started calling it in class, G-Craw-Cap. (laughs) G-Craw-Crap. Do you remember how we came up with the name? I think I'll need to be... Reminded. Reminded. How did we come up with the name? Well, you and I were talking about the format of the class. We were emailing back and forth, and I asked you, hey, if a name kind of sparks in your imagination, let me know. And you wrote down this long thing, I think, as a joke. And I showed it to Samantha, and she was like, I love it. And so there it became. The the more words, the better. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) You know, although this was a writing class, and you were definitely teaching us the nuts and bolts of constructing a comedy spot and the different characters and their intentions. As a student, I really felt like there was a lot of other lessons, like what I like to call next level lessons, Mm -hmm. lessons you were going to learn past what you think you're going to learn, really bouncing off the walls for those four weeks. Stuff that was going to make us better actors, not just writers. Uh, What was your experience? What were you feeling was happening amongst the students during the four weeks? Yeah, well, I, I think of it. I think of it as sort of a grand experiment because everybody in the class was primarily an actor, and we were going to be doing our own writing. I remember uh, the decision, an off-the-cuff decision early on, was to not record or perform anything that we did not write or improvise in class. I think we made that decision within the first ten minutes, and Absolutely. I took my big bag of scripts and tossed it off to the side. <laughs> We were learning how to write comedy scripts, but what we were learning was also going to help us analyze scripts better, audition better, be stronger performers. Why do you think that was happening out there? Well, one of the things uh, that actors try to hang on to is um, I, I need is the idea that we need to be funny. And if we can set that aside, uh, there's all sorts of lessons to be learned because uh, funniness is is not anything you can control. Funniness is something that is a response, uh, that somebody else's response. So if the actor or the writer is focused on on that outcome, it's an outcome you have no control over. But you do have control over the art of of comedy, which is a, a character doing their best with l- limited uh, resources and certainly with limited awareness to try to accomplish something that probably doesn't need to be uh, accomplished. So it's a way of looking at the world rather than a way of, uh, of of performing. And I think also it helped us put ourselves in the writer's shoes. We get so caught up in being the actor and the performer, having to come up with a spot and how hard it is really to come up with something that's compelling or that an actor can really bring to life. I'm looking at scripts differently now as I audition, just because I've had a, the littlest bit of experience on the other side of the glass. I know you've done a lot of things. You're a director, a writer, actor. Do you feel like your writing makes you a better actor and vice versa? How do those things inform each other? One thing that comes to mind is that both both efforts share a lot of anxiety. And so that's why we talked a lot about anxiety and personal expectations and is this funny? And that is the same anxiety we have as as performers. And once we realize that we have no control over what happens after we have made our attempts uh, to tell a story, either as a performer or as a writer, then we let our characters 
show us the way. Yeah. Do the and talking, so to speak. They do the talking. And so we don't have to force them to do anything because they are wind up toys and they and they move ahead. So we don't have to push so hard as writers. Once we understand what these people want, then just keep allowing them to keep trying and keep trying and keep trying. So I want to get to, I know the listeners are probably eager to get to our five finalists. We came up, or you came up with five finalists, and two of them became honorable mentions, mm-hmm. and three of them became the gold, silver, and bronze. And so these were the ones that got to be recorded and produced by you. So we're going to listen to the two honorable mentions. The first spot is called Kale, and it's written by Nina Greeley. For those of you listening, go ahead and look at the screen, and you'll see the list of actors. And the next one after that is going to be Foodie, and Foodie was written by Christian Nielsen Buckhold. Hello. Hi, I'm Lisa. I'm here to tell you about our new organic produce boxes. Oh, uh, okay. Our vegetables are all organic and locally grown. Okay, so what's in what's in the box? Whatever's in season. We have everything. Okay. Well, what for example, what would I get this week? Curly kale. Oh, kale. Okay. Uh, what else? Dinosaur kale. Isn't isn't that just another type of kale? No, it's dinosaur kale. Okay. Well, what else? Premier kale. Anything other than kale? There's red Russian kale. Miss, that's just more kale. No, it's not. It's red Russian kale. Red Russian kale is more than just a vegetable, you know. It also makes a very attractive addition to any wardrobe as a splash of color on a hat. It does wonderful things for your third eye, and it also makes an excellent cat litter. Anything besides kale? Walking stick kale. No, I mean besides kale. Let's see. We also have red boar kale, kamame red kale, and Siberian... That's all the same thing! No, it's not. How, How is Siberian kale different... From red Russian kale. It has a different aura. Look, don't you have anything that doesn't have the word kale in the name? I'm not following you. Like potatoes. Do you grow potatoes? Yes. Oh, I get a potato in the box? No. No? Why? We have potato boar kale, but that only grows in early spring when it's been raining a lot. Yes. All right, I'll take it. Hi, do you have a reservation? No, I don't have one. Oh. But I am a friend of the owner's. Oh, I'm sorry. He saw me taking a photo of my dish last week and had to introduce himself and compliment me on my keen eye. Um. I'm a foodie. Oh, a table just opened up. Your server will be with you shortly. Thank you. Good evening, ma'am. How are you tonight? Do you know what you'd like to order? Yes. I'll have the grass-fed beef tenderloin with marrow, pan-roasted parsnips, and wilted arugula. Excellent. Only, can you make it with pork chop, roasted kumquats, and pumpkin seeds instead? Oh, I'm sorry, but... It's okay. I'm a foodie. Oh, of course. Right away. Oh, chef! Yes? Would you give a private cooking class at my home for myself and some friends next Saturday night? No, no, we don't do that. Did I mention we're foodies? Oh, it would be my honor. Uh, No charge, of course. Wonderful. Hello, neighbors. I'm just going to set my chair on top of your table so I can enjoy a view of the kitchen. You stepped on our farfalle. Wait, are you a foodie? Yes, Yes, we're we're foodies. foodies. Terrific. Here, have the rest of our Chateau Neuf 72. Thank you. Help! My wife slipped and fell onto a piece of broken glass. And her neck, it's bleeding badly. Chef? Yes, foodie? Heat a parry knife until it glows. Here you go. I'm going to cauterize your wound to stop the bleeding. Wait, are you a trauma surgeon? No, but as an amateur food critic with a blog that gets hundreds of unique page views a month, I write detailed accounts of my dining experiences with honesty, humor, and a dash of spice. She's a foodie! Good enough for me. Cut her open, foodie. Thank you, foodie. Of course. Now where's my wilted arugula? Coming right up, foodie. Awesome spots. Love them. Kale. So what are your thoughts on the kale spot? I remember when this idea came first came through, and this is a, this is a great example of a comic character who has, who's um, single-minded. We called it the, the blind achiever in class, mm-hmm. and that uh, even though this character who had only, um, only kale to sell didn't really know that she only had kale to sell. She just saw kale as different types of vegetables. And it's that blindness which really worked. Uh, The performance is great. At first, it started out, I remember, as um, someone who came to the door with a lot of sales energy, Mm -hmm. which when we step back and look at this character, she's 
a farmer. She grows kale. She's going door to door with her box of kale. She's probably tired, and she's probably been to 100 doors already, <laughs> and nobody's buying her damn kale. <laughs> and the foodie spot, I by the end of that spot, I could literally visualize the cape like she was a superhero. So this spot... Because it was so complex, I felt like there was a lot of collaboration. What I loved is when we were actually recording the session, you were really bringing the students in. Yeah, what I—it's interesting that that when Christian brought up the foodie, he he brought he the weeks earlier he brought it in as a uh, as a rant, a monologue rant, and the one thing that jumped out was his uh, was the amount of resentment he personally brought. To people who uh, about people who declare themselves foodies, being a waiter for so many years as he has, uh, yeah, <laughs> right. And so that's where we start with a lot about you know, as you remember, we you know what rankles us, what 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 angers us, what mm-hmm. resentments, uh, whether they're reasonable resentments or not. Um, mm-hmm. And it was that phrase, "I'm a foodie," which uh, tickled me. And he kept working on it and created this wild scenario mm-hmm. where. Uh, declaring yourself a foodie uh, gives you permission to do just about anything you want, including surgery on a, including surgery, <laughs> including putting your, you know, your your chair on top of somebody else's table. <laughs> I've heard from people who've had sessions with you that the words are merely a suggestion and they're the starting point. And how do you approach a session with an actor, just not expecting them to be a puppet behind the mic, but really wanting collaboration with your artist? Well, I think once we all understand what the main character's obsession is, that's our anchor. As long as we all are on board with that, we can we have huge permission to say and do just about anything. And what I love from an actor is when an actor says, excuse me, can I try something? That's when I sit back and go, God, that makes my life easier. Someone's going to be writing for me. That's terrific. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But very often it starts a, oh, a new discussion and a new, uh, a, some, a new, some new intention or choice. And maybe sparks something in you as the director or the writer saying, oh, I never thought of that. Let's go there and let's just see what happens. Yeah. Just take five the minutes. grand experiment. Yeah. It's all a grand experiment. Exactly. Okay. So now we're going to get to the three award winning spots. Great. We're going to start with our bronze spot. It's called Confession, and it was written by Liz O'Neill. Jason, can I talk to you? Sure. What's up, Mary? Well, I'm in a bind, and I have to confess to Father O'Brien tomorrow, and my conscience is totally clean. I haven't done anything bad. (laughs) Wow. Uh, All right. How can I... I'll make you a better Catholic. Uh, Well, maybe you could help me sin? All right. Uh, i got a few minutes. Oh, uh, thanks. Actually, I have a good idea. Let's okay. take the Lord's name in vain. How about that? Oh, Christ on a stick. That's a good idea. Mary, mother of God in a pantsuit. That's so sweet. Holy streetwalkers for Jesus. And I mean it with all my heart. Right on. Uh, what else What else can we do? What if we get wasted? Nice. Hey, if we steal the booze, that'll make it a bigger sin. Oh, yeah. Oh, let's take the sacramental wine from the church and get hammered. You are, you're good at this. Um, <laughs> hey, once, once we're drunk enough, we, we should have sex. We could have drunk sex. I mean, seriously, Jason, you could plow me into next Sunday. That would definitely take care of that clean conscience. We, we could, and, and we could have sex with a condom. If we don't use a condom, you could knock me up and, like, that's even more simple, right? That's, that would be right. <gasps> Let's use a faulty condom and get knocked up. I see you working. Um... I think you might be onto something. This this should be enough for Father O'Brien, I, I think. Mary, mother of God in a nightgown. You are right, Jason. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's get to this. I got a better idea, though. Or I got another idea. Let's stop by the garden supply store first. There's huh? this um, false idol I've had my eye on for a while. Oh, the lawn gnome, yeah? He can watch. He can totally watch us. <laughs> oh, my yeah. God. Father O'Brien's going to be so proud of me. Yeah. Totally. Sam, I think one of the lessons from this spot, as we were recording it, Um, Dave and I were starting and we were being really excited and we were getting all hyper about this scenario, this nonsensical scenario that uh, Liz created. And your first direction was like, hey, guys, let's pull it way back. And I remember thinking as a performer, God, is this going to be funny? Maybe as a performer, I feel compelled to be big and broad. And what actually made it funny is they were so casually talking about something so crazy and important. It makes sense that your first 
rea- your, your reaction to performing it is to make it big because I remember there were exclamation points all over the script. There was the subject matter was things that people get excited about, about, mm-hmm. about, about sex and cursing. And so that excitement makes, makes sense. But if we step back into these characters, they're probably 14, 15 years old. They've never cursed before. They've never had sex before. So it's all this mysterious world. Then once we step into that and drop into that embarrassed energy of of a young woman pulling her friend aside in a classroom and having this little confession between themselves became this, this naive tension between them. We keep getting told in class, you know, take the words off the page. And I felt like as you started to rewrite it, I wasn't as married to the page because I couldn't be. And it really, I remember, and Dave and I talked about this after we came out of the booth, it really was just us, felt like an improv at the end. In fact, the last couple lines, I took his line and he went with it and it just kind of happened. And it was really a great experience as a performer. That's a secret that I picked up from the great John Crawford that we would... I, I was an actor in, in a lot of his scripts, and we would redo it and redo it and redo it to the point where, I mean, we were trying to write on this piece of cloth, and we were poking holes in our scripts, and we can't read what we're reading. You'd performed it so many times, and you knew what the characters wanted, that it didn't really, the words didn't matter anymore. Exactly. It was really a great experience. Cool. So, we're, next we're going to go to the Silver Award winner, and this is called Crocodile, and it was written by Amy Larson. I notice the steam rising from the humus indicates a perfect temperature for crocodile egg incubation below the surface. And that hatching is imminent. Oh, Professor, I've read that the saltwater crocodile is the most ferocious crocodile of all, responsible for hundreds of human deaths each year. Right, oh, Ms. White. The mother salties, as they are called, are very protective of their nests. She will viciously attack any creature who dares disturb her egg. I say, Jim, why don't you go over and remove the humus layer covering the nest to show Ms. White the eggs? Okay, boss. Professor, do I hear peeping? The sound of a new hatchling, music to a mother's ears. She will return swiftly when she hears her babies calling her. Uh, Jim, my boy, see if you can find one of the baby salties to show Ms. White. Oh, uh, like, like this? Yes, uh, wave it about by the tail. Oh, and uh, here comes the mother. Look at her swim. Oh. Notice how her streamlined body allows her to move swiftly and silently through the water. Wait, what? Oh, yes, Professor. I hear they're ambush hunters. Yes, ambush hunters. With Jim's head buried deep in the nest, he has no idea she is approaching. I'm holding two baby crocodiles. Splendid. Uh, hold one up for us, will you? Uh, uh, like, like this? Uh, oh. oh, she is swift. Notice how her strong jaws open and close so quickly, using 3,000 pounds of force per square inch, snapping her target right in two. Like a potato chip. Yes, exactly like a potato crisp. No worries, Jim. Can you use your other hand? I don't think I have another hand. Ouch! And there she goes again. Relentless. There really is no stopping her once she is angered. I think I dropped one. Kind of hard without any arms. So disappointing. No, oh, but look at her now. She most commonly does in her prey by pulling them deeper into the water and drowning them. Oh, As oh, Jim is so ably demonstrating. You two work so well together. Indeed. I say, Jim, can you tell us how deep the water is? Jim? Jim? Well, more food for us. Time for lunch. Well, Sam, talk about a blind achiever. That professor, he was going to do what he needed to do. Both he and Ms. White. That was actually a discussion we had with the uh, writer was who, who's the, who are the blind achievers and who are the helpless observers in this. And that we figured that they're both coming from the same uh, blind point of view. It put the character of Jim into, a, uh, into, the, into the role of what, what's called the straight man. This kind of brings up the improv subject because... Christian's last line was partially improv, and it actually turned out to be one of the funniest lines in the spot. And again, this environment you create of let's just try it out and improv and see what happens often comes up with the funniest bits. I remember when we did the end of that, we just did that wild several times uh, and and we were just making things up because Jim had was clearly drowned at the time, so he didn't have any lines. And so we, the two actors just figured out what would you say to uh, calm 
body of water where something used to be happening and now nothing's happening. And, uh, and that's where he came up with that line. I want to talk about improv and auditioning because you're also somebody who listens to audition and casts spots. And I know when we're doing medical narration or TV spots, there's not a lot of improv wiggle room. But tell me what you're looking for in general and maybe how improv plays into that when you're listening to auditions to cast. What jumps out at you? What makes you think this is somebody I might want to work with? Well, yeah. And that's my caveat is that this is my point of view yeah. rather than many other writers like to have their words said word for for word. Mm-hmm. And I can understand that. As long as an actor understands that uh, what the character wants, then I, I really don't care what the words are. As long as they're true to the character. As long as they're true to the character, to the intention of what the character is trying to um, accomplish. Mm-hmm. In terms of improv and auditioning, I, as a selfish writer who likes to steal other people's ideas, I've more than one occasion taken a line that's a, uh, that an actor has, has improv and, and Put gave it, in it a spot. try in the, in the spot. Uh, they come at it from a very fresh point of view and, and don't have the uh, legions of clients sitting on my shoulders who are telling me what not to write. So, mm-hmm. And also, I, you know, in auditions, it's about 50% of the time I know from an audition exactly, I think I know exactly what I want. But there's a lot where I just leave it open. I just want to hear what the natural voices have to say and what and where people are going. And sometimes that includes improv. And I'm sure there's been times where you thought you knew what you wanted and then maybe heard something else and thought, oh, that's what I want. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I I hope to be surprised by uh, auditions. So now we've come to our gold winning spot. It's called Dungeons and Dragons, and it was written by Stephen Barlow. As you enter the crowded tavern, the stench of stale ale assaults your nostrils. I raise my shield to defend. Defend against what? The stench. What? That that doesn't make any sense. It's assaulting my nostrils. It's a figure of speech. It just smells bad in the tavern. Fine. I leave the tavern to find a good-smelling tavern. No. But there isn't another tavern. You're in a tiny village on the outskirts of the realm. So everybody in this town is happy going to this one smelly tavern that doesn't even serve fresh ale? They're not happy about it. It, it. It's just the only tavern. Okay. I open a competing tavern across the street. No, Mindy. You're on a quest to defeat the Troll King. You can't just drop it to start a small business. My years of knighthood have been long and taxing. And the time has come to hang up my sword. I spent hours planning this campaign, and and you're ruining it. Hey, it's not my fault Dungeons & Dragons is a game of freedom and creativity. Now roll the dice to find out how well my tavern does. Fine. Your tavern? It becomes so popular that people flock to it from all corners of the land. You're rich beyond measure. Okay. I buy a mansion with a swimming pool. It's the Middle Ages. There aren't any swimming pools. I invent the swimming pool. You you can't just... Roll the dice! Oh. You successfully invent the swimming pool, doubling your fortune. Now, I go out on a date with Brandon Spiffman from third period. Brandon Spiffman? Sir Brandon, and I want to roll to see what base he gets on. I hope it's second base. (laughs) Nobody even knows what second base is. Roll him! Oh, you get to second base with Brandon Spiffman. I... Now roll for C-cups. Oh. So there it was, our gold medal winning spot. What I loved about this spot is that, is that Dungeons and Dragons is being a role-playing game is about, uh, is about people who have no power finding power. That's what I've always enjoyed about it. And this relationship is a, is a power struggle between a, a man who has designed a game and a young woman who wants to change her life. But they both are completely invested in the idea that this game can accomplish both of these things simultaneously. One little antidote about this spot is that when Stephen first cast me and Chuck in this, he didn't really tell us anything and there were no specs. And so Chuck and I went outside and practiced it and came up with our own interpretation. 
And my interpretation was that she was a little bit younger. And what Stephen Barlow told me after class is that he had never even considered that character to be younger, but that he liked the idea so much that that spurred his rewrite and how we came up with the final product. And so when it comes to specs, there's a lots of do we listen to him? Do we not listen to him? Do you have an opinion on how much of the time do you as an actor, do you follow the specs and go outside of the box? Following the specs is a, or not following the specs is a, is a, is a, is a tricky one. Um, you know, most writers don't really have a lot of experience with actors in the first place. So they'll write to what they ear they think they want to hear, but uh, it's up to the actors to help open up what they think they want to hear. It goes back to you maybe during auditions, you think you know what you want to hear, but then someone comes up with something that you haven't thought of, and that might be, and you're open to that being the avenue you go down. So maybe yeah. the lesson for actors are to don't worry maybe so much about the specs because you never know the writer on the other end of that or the producer on the other end of that spot might think, I love it and I never thought of it that way. Yeah, and it's commitment to whatever you're, whatever you're doing. So, yeah, I, frankly, I'd like to be surprised. Mr. Pond, we've come to the end of the line, as you like to say, in this interview. I'd just like to hear what was your experience for this class? It was the first time we taught it. What did you get out of it? What I love is that it was like it was like interactive tinkering. As a as a, in the writing part of my business, I spent a lot of time alone in coffee shops uh, trying to entertain myself. But here we had a, a group of ten or twelve people, and we just experimented and tinkered and played and and uh, and figured things out on our feet. And it's amazing how, I mean, I remember coming out of that last class where we, we did the we recorded the five finalists and I was just completely jacked up because we were all nobody was really thinking that much and we were completely intuitively making choices making choices making choices uh, as opposed to staring at pieces of paper and maybe that's the greatest lesson of all it's the grand experiment it is the grand experiment thanks so much for being here Sam we appreciate it thanks Vicki Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Vicki. And a huge thank you to the 12 talented participants in this great comedy radio writing and act... Uh, what was the name of it again? Uh, in the great comedy writing... Uh, oh, shoot. I always hated the name of this class. In the, uh, the great comedy radio acting and writing class competition and podcast. Oh, for f***'s sake.